Let's talk about that first. The idea of a fundamental moral principle. Um, a principle is, in other words, a rule. Okay? Now, um, many people believe in moral rules. There are certain moral rules that we should follow. For example, don't steal, or it is wrong to steal. You could look at that as a rule. Don't cheat. It is wrong to cheat. Or, for example, it is good to give charity. It is good to help people who are in distress. Those are what we might call moral rules. Now, the idea of a fundamental moral principle <clears throat> is the idea that there's a single underlying rule which is in some way the basis of all the other moral rules that we might believe in or that are true according to a given theory. So, for example, um, Mill would say that there is a fundamental moral principle. There is a single rule which underlies, I'll try to explain what that means, but the fundamental moral principle is a rule that underlies all of the other rules that we might believe in. So, uh, what is the fundamental moral principle? According to Mill, it's the principle of utility. Now, what is the principle of utility? Basically, the principle of utility says as follows. Let me write that on the board. All right. Mill believes that there is a fundamental moral principle. It's a single rule which underlies all the other rules and which can be used in any possible situation to determine what is either right or wrong. Okay, what is the fundamental moral principle according to Mill? It's the principle of utility. The principle of utility says as follows. I'll write it on the board and then we'll try to explain it. Uh, it goes like this. Given a set of options, okay, given that you, had a, you have a set of options, options are simply uh, choices about what you might or might, do, might or might not do in any given circumstance, given a set of options, that action which promotes the greatest amount of social happiness. Now I'll have to explain what that means, social happiness is the morally right action. Okay, I hope you can see that. Given a set of options, that action which promotes the greatest amount of social happiness is the morally right action to do. So according to Mill, this is the principle of utility and this is the fundamental moral principle. Okay, now we're going to have to talk a little bit more about what this phrase social happiness means and Mill has a specific theory about what happiness is. We're going to get into that. But um, for now, let's go back to the idea of a fundamental moral principle. Now, here's what Mill would say about other moral rules. Mill believes that there are a number of secondary moral rules, okay? Secondary moral rules. Okay, secondary moral rules are the 
list of do's and don'ts that we ordinarily would rely upon to guide our actions. So for example, a secondary moral rule might be something like, don't murder. There's going to be don'ts and do's. Basically, there are positive uh, or negative moral rules, and then there are going to be positive moral rules. So, for example, give charity. You could probably make a list of all the moral rules that you think we should not obey, and all the more, oh, sorry, all the moral rules that you think tell us what we should not do, and all of the moral rules which tell us what we should do. So, for example, give charity, help people in distress. What's another don't? We would say something like, don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't insult people. What can we put on the positive side over here? I got my positive rules and my net. These are all secondary moral rules according to Mill. Okay, now this list is not going to be complete. If we spent, you know, another hour, we could probably come up with more and more and more rules that we tend to believe in uh, that describe what is our moral obligation or what are our moral obligations, what are things we should not do. Let's say, um, be truthful. Be honest. Uh, what else can we say? Be faithful. Keep your word. Um, for the don'ts, can we add some others to don't? We have don't murder, don't cheat, don't lie, don't insult people, don't maim. Don't maim the people. Do not cause injury. Don't injure others. Okay? Now, Again, like I say, this is not a complete list. If we spend more time, we could probably come up with a few more rules, maybe a lot more rules that most of us tend to believe in. Okay, but these are called secondary moral rules. Now, according to Mill, there are two important differences between the secondary moral rules and the fundamental moral principle. This is the fundamental moral principle. This, in other words, is, we could say that this is the primary, fundamental or primary. This is the primary moral rule, and these are only secondary. The difference is as follows. There's really two differences between the fundamental moral principle and secondary moral rules. First of all, the fundamental moral principle, according to Mill, and anyone who believes in a fundamental moral principle is going to say this, the fundamental moral principle is the basis for why these are even true in the first place. Okay? In other words, Miller would say like this, what is it about giving charity that's so good? Why do we think it's good? Why do we think that helping people in distress is a good thing? Why? Because it flows from that primary principle of trying to bring about, or sometimes Mill says, and utilitarians will speak this way, maximize social happiness. Try to make as many people happy as possible. That's what morality is all about. That's why these things are worthy of our obedience. And what's wrong with murder? Why is cheating and lying and insulting people and injuring people? Why is that? Why are those things wrong? They're wrong precisely because they fail to promote happiness, okay? And actually, um, this gives me an opportunity to sort of elaborate a little bit on what the principle of utility is saying, because the principle of utility, as I have it on the board here, is really a little bit, uh, it's incomplete. 
What I mean by that is, it doesn't say anything about what's morally wrong, okay? Well, what's morally wrong is what fails to promote or what causes unhappiness, okay? If an action is going to cause unhappiness to society at large, then Mill would say it's a wrong action. So, getting back to the point I was making earlier, according to Mill, the fundamental moral principle underlies the secondary moral uh, the secondary moral rules. The reason why murder, cheating, lying, insulting, and injuring uh, is wrong is precisely because it fails to promote happiness, and in fact, it promotes unhappiness. So, one of the differences between the fundamental moral principle and the secondary moral rules is that the reason why these are true is because of this, okay? Another difference between the fundamental moral principle and secondary moral rules is that the fundamental moral principle has no exceptions. This is a very important part of Mill's theory. The fundamental moral principle is something that you should always obey without exception. These secondary moral rules have legitimate exceptions. There are times when for any one of these rules that I have on the board, there might be an exception to when you're entitled to do that action. So, for example, uh, sometimes Mill would say it is morally right to lie or even to cheat and in some cases maybe even to kill someone. In some cases you cannot and should not help someone who is in distress. In some cases, you should not or need not give charity. It depends on the situation. Okay, so for example, classic example of this is suppose, and this is something you should think about because here you might be able, you might be able to use this little example to test whether you agree with Mill. Okay, suppose that someone is in danger of losing their life unless you in some way lie or tell a falsehood, okay? Classic example of that is, let's suppose you know that someone wants to kill someone else and the potential murderer comes to you and asks you, do you know where this person is? And let's suppose you know, maybe you're even hiding them in your attic, okay, or in your backyard, okay. Should you lie in order to save a person's life? Well, Mill would say, yes, at least in most cases, that would be the right thing to do. Because the only reason you shouldn't lie is to prevent unhappiness from occurring in society. And again, we're gonna to have to get into what does that mean? What is happiness, according to Mill? He has a theory about that, but let's just assume that it's true for the sake of conversation right now, that lying in general does not promote social happiness. Okay, so the only reason you're not supposed to lie is because lying fails to promote happiness in society at large. Well, if you can save someone's life by lying, then the calculation is, okay, well, if I lie, I'm going to cause a certain amount of unhappiness. But if I don't lie, if I tell the truth, this person is going to lose their life. And that's going to be a very unhappy result. So therefore, in this situation, I should, according to Mill, I should make an exception to the rule of don't lie or make an exception to the rule of be truthful. So sometimes you have to injure people, right? I mean... For example, if someone's about to kill you, Mill would say, well, if they're going to kill you and you can injure them and save your life, well, then in general, injuring people is wrong. But sometimes that's what you have to do in order to promote the greater amount of social happiness. So the secondary moral rules have exceptions. When do they have exceptions? 
precisely when making that exception will promote the social happiness at large, of the, the greater social happiness in society. Okay, now, uh, at this point we can also say uh, that Mill would say, we have a little argument. Why should I, let's ask this question, why should I believe, or why does Mill believe in the principle of utility? Why does Mill believe that that action which promotes the greatest amount of happiness in society is the morally right action. So, Mill gives what we might call, I'm gonna call this the common denominator argument. Okay, I'm going to erase this just to make some room. And just to put this term, this phrase up on the board, we have something called the common denominator argument. Okay, the common denominator argument for the principle of utility goes like this. I just gave you a list of rules of do's and don'ts. I presume that you, most of you who are listening to this, would agree that these are the moral don'ts, and I don't have enough room to write them all down, but you can imagine writing down some other do's and writing down some other don'ts. But um, what Mill would say is if you look at all of the don'ts and you look at all of the do's and you ask yourself this question, what is the common denominator of the do's and the don'ts? What do all these things have in common? And what do all these things have in common? So Mill answers, well, in general, what is it that is in common among the do's? It's that they promote social happiness. They make more people more happy more of the time. What is a common denominator of these negative actions? They bring about social unhappiness. And so therefore, we can say that this, we have reason to believe that this really is the fundamental moral principle. So that's what's called the common denominator argument. Again, what do all the do's have in common? They promote social happiness. What do all the don'ts have in common? They promote social unhappiness. Therefore, generalizing, from these examples, we could say that, well, that's what makes these actions right, and that's what makes these actions wrong. The fact that they either promote or fail to promote social happiness is what makes them right or what makes them wrong. Now, next time, or the time after that, in another lecture on Mill, we're going to get to a different argument that Mill gives to try to support the principle of utility. But this is at least one argument, the common denominator argument, in favor of the principle of utility. Okay, now let's talk about um, the following concept which is associated with Mill's view. So I'm going to do a little erasing here. Okay, uh, just to make room. I'll leave the principle on the board. But the, the theory of utility, or the principle of utility, the theory of utilitarianism, is known as a consequentialistic theory. In other words, well, let's put this phrase down on the board. Mill believes in something called consequentialism. What is consequentialism? Obviously, it has something to do with the word consequences. So, consequentialism is the view, I'll write it down on the board here. This is a view that Mill has. It goes sort of hand in hand with uh, utilitarianism, it says as follows, consequentialism says as follows, the moral worth of an action, 
is determined by its consequences. Or, let's say, let's call it the net result. The moral worth. Now, what I mean by that is the rightness or wrongness, the moral worth of an action, whether it's right or wrong, is determined by the results, the consequences of the action. As opposed to, let's say, for example, the intention of the person doing the action, the reason for why, the motive for why the person did the action is not going to determine whether the action is actually right or wrong. What's going to make the action right or wrong is what does it bring about? What are its consequences? What is the net result of the action? So I hope you can see that indeed the principle of utility is a consequentialistic principle. Okay, the principle of utility says what's going to determine whether your action is right or wrong has to do with the net result. Now, in particular, the net result, according to utilitarianism, the relevant net result is social happiness. Okay, and again, we have to talk more about what does that mean, social happiness? We'll get to that. But that is the relevant result that is crucial to determining whether a given action is morally right or morally wrong, according to the principle of utility. Now, I said before, I want to explain something. I said before that um, we had before on the board this idea of a fundamental moral principle. And I just want to explain that you could believe in a fundamental moral principle, but still disagree with the principle of utility. Okay, then you'd be disagreeing with the heart of Mill's theory. Okay, but you might believe that there is a fundamental moral principle, but disagree with what Mill thinks the fundamental moral principle is. I'll just give you an example of a theory like that. Let's suppose you believe that what makes an action moral or not is whether it brings about happiness for God. Okay, let's suppose you believe in God and you believe that it makes sense to talk about God being happy or unhappy. Of course, that might be a theological question like what why would God be happy or unhappy? What does that mean? But let's suppose you believe that certain actions bring about happiness for God and certain actions make God angry or upset. Okay? And let's suppose you believe that that's what morality is all about. You believe that an action is morally right if it brings about happiness for God and an action is morally wrong if it makes God unhappy. So that would mean you believe in a fundamental moral principle. You believe that there's a single rule which can be used to determine in any possible situation whether it's right or wrong. If it makes God happy, it's right. If it makes God unhappy, then it's wrong. Okay, you might agree with that list of secondary moral rules. You might uh, believe, let's say, in the Ten Commandments or in some other list of rules that you think God has uh, revealed possibly in the Bible or in some other text, but if you believe that whatever makes God happy is morally right and whatever makes God unhappy is morally wrong, that would mean that you believe in a fundamental moral principle or you could use that as a fundamental moral principle. And that also sounds consequentialistic, doesn't it? Right? Because the moral worth of an action is determined by its consequences. Does it make God happy or not? It's a result that will determine whether the action is right or wrong. Okay, so I'm just trying to illustrate that you can believe in a fundamental moral principle and believe in consequentialism and still think that Mill is wrong about the principle of utility.
I hope that that is clear. Maybe you can think of some other examples of consequentialistic moral theories, which are also different from Mill's fundamental moral principle. Um, now, there are, of course, philosophers who would disagree with the idea of a fundamental moral principle. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, some philosophers, and perhaps you could say that perhaps Aristotle falls into this category, something to think about. Um, if you think back to our discussion of Aristotle, let me put this question on the board. Does Aristotle believe in a fundamental moral principle? Okay, I'm abbreviating that FMP. Maybe I'll leave you that as a question to think about, but what Aristotle talks about is well, virtue, remember, virtue has to do with living a rational life. And you're supposed to use reason to figure out what to do. You're supposed to use reason to control your actions and emotions. He does give us some guidelines. Remember the doctrine of the mean? You should try to hit the mean between extremes when it comes to your emotions and your passions and your actions. But is there a single rule that you can use in all possible cases to determine where the mean is? That's not so clear. Aristotle doesn't focus so much on actions per se. He focuses more on character traits, developing the character traits of virtue, developing the theoretical character traits, remember, wisdom and uh, open-mindedness. We talked about the various theoretical virtues that Aristotle believes in. Um, it's not clear that Aristotle thinks there's a single rule that you can use to determine whether all possible, in all possible cases, what is either right or wrong by looking at the consequences of the action. Okay, and it doesn't seem like, well, you can argue that maybe, maybe Aristotle is a consequentialist because doesn't he say, that's a different question, does Aristotle believe in consequentialism? Now, Aristotle does say that we have this goal, right? The goal is our own happiness and that virtue is a means to an end of happiness. So perhaps you could say that uh, what Aristotle is all about is his theory of virtue is all about is trying to get to that end of social happiness. So perhaps he is a consequentialist. Does he believe in a fundamental moral principle? I would say it's at least cloudy whether he believes in a fundamental principle or not. Okay. Uh, some philosophers reject the idea of a fundamental moral principle. Some philosophers would say, there's no single rule that you can use in all possible circumstances to determine what is right or wrong. Uh, rather, there's sort of that list of do's and don'ts that are, generally speaking, what we should follow. Um, but there's no underlying rule that's always true without exception. Okay, I think what we need to do here is talk about Mill's, what Mill has to say about social happiness. Okay, so we have two things here, obviously. We have happiness and we have social happiness. Okay, so let's talk about happiness first. And of course, this is a big question in philosophy. What is happiness? Okay, Mill has a theory about what he thinks happiness is for human beings. Okay, what he says is that happiness is essentially pleasure. So we're going back to 
the idea of pleasure, which we've talked about before in this class. Happiness is pleasure, and unhappiness is pain. Now, pleasure is something that you know when you're having it. Pleasure is a sensation or a feeling that it's hard to describe, but you know when you're having an experience that's pleasurable, and you know when you're having an experience that is painful. So, happiness is pleasure, unhappiness is pain. Social happiness, what that means is that when you're considering what you should do, according to Mill, when you're trying to decide whether a given action is right or wrong, you should take into account the effect of that action on your potential pleasure or pain, and also on everyone else around you that is affected by your action, how much pleasure or pain is it going to cause to yourself, to those around you, and then what you're supposed to do, according to Mill, is try as hard as you can to determine what is the net total amount of pleasure that is produced by your action in society at large, meaning if it affects anybody, you should take into account the effect of your action on that person's pleasure or pain. And then in some way, Mill thinks that we can somehow quantify our pleasure, our pain, and come to some kind of judgment about how much pleasure in society at large is this action going to bring about, or how much pleasure and or pain is any alternative. Remember, you only, you only have what options face you, okay? Let me, let me talk about that for a second, given a set of options. Why is this phrase over here, given a set of options? Let's suppose, for example, that you have, you're a doctor and you have a patient and the patient has a very, very serious problem with one of their limbs, let's say their arm, and that there's an infection in that arm and you have, basically you have two choices. You can either operate and remove the arm surgically, that's gonna cause some amount of pain, even if you're using painkillers, right? that's going to be causing some amount of future pain and it's going, to, it's going to cause a privation of a certain kind of pleasure which that person would have if they had their arm, okay? On the other hand, let's suppose you know that if you don't amputate their arm, so let's suppose that then you know the person eventually the infection is going to spread, unfortunately, and they're going to lose their life, uh, let's say, in a year. So according to Mill, you should do what is called a utilitarian calculus. Let's put that phrase on the board. Utilitarian calculus. Utilitarian calculus. That's just a fancy way of saying that you figure out or you estimate, or in some cases you even have to, as they say, guesstimate. You guesstimate how much pleasure and or pain is one option going to bring about, let's say if I amputate the arm, versus if I don't amputate the arm, the person's going to, let's say, die in a year, and they're not going to have any pleasure because they're dead after they die. They don't have pleasure, we presume. Okay, um, so in that situation, uh, you don't, you're not able to just, just do the best possible thing. Well, you're doing the best possible thing. You're, you'd rather have another option of somehow curing the infection and that way the person will be the happiest in the end, okay? But you always have to look at what your options are. Given the set of options that are available to you at a certain time, the action which promotes the greatest happiness is the morally right one. So, of course, in the case of amputation, in the case that I gave you, Mill's thinking seems to be correct, right? That, well, uh, if I have the, if those are my choices, is he gonna die if I don't do the amputation? Well, he's gonna lose his arm, yeah, if I do amputate, that's gonna be somewhat painful, but 
on balance, the net result is going to be more happy for him, for his family, for society, if I can save his life, even though he's going to lose his arm. Okay, so the term, we, we need to talk more about pleasure and pain, okay? But, and Mill has a certain twist theory about pleasure and pain, which we're going to get into. Um, maybe we'll save that for next time. But let's go back to the idea of social happiness. Again, society is a group of people who more or less live together in such a way that their actions have an effect on those other members, okay? If somebody lives on the other side of the planet or somebody lives on the moon, um, and my actions and their actions don't have any effect on one or another. Their actions have no effect on me, my actions have no effect on them, then we would count that as a separate society completely. But in any situation where we have a group of people that they live in proximity enough that their actions affect everybody else's actions, then that counts as one society. Now, in today's day and age, it could be argued that really the entire world is one society because we know only too well that the actions of a group of people on one, in one place on earth can easily come to affect what happens uh, on the other side of the world, right? Because of travel, because of communication, because of interaction. It's really one world that we live in. So in some way, it could be argued that the world population is really, in some sense, one society. It's one group of uh, people whose actions have an effect on everybody else or potentially have an effect on everybody else. Anyway, let's not get uh, off on that too much. The point is to try to understand what the principle of utility is saying. What we're saying here with social happiness is, again, every time that I act, according to Mill, every time that I act or every time that anybody does an action in society, they ought to take into account the effect of their action on their own happiness, i.e., is it going to cause them pleasure or pain? And is it going to cause pleasure and pain to anybody else? And then they, so to speak, add up or quantify, try to quantify how much pleasure is this going to cause for me? How much pain is it going to cause for me if I do this action? And how much pleasure or pain is it going to bring about for anyone who is affected by my action? So if an action is going to cause me a certain amount of pleasure, but it's going to bring about a lot of pain for a lot of people, then of course, Mill would say, it's wrong, okay? You're not supposed to act only on the basis of your own pleasure. You're supposed to act on the basis of how much pleasure are you producing for all of those around you that your action happens to affect, and how much pain is your action producing that... Uh, uh, for those around you or for those that your action will affect. So that's the idea of social happiness. Now, what we still need to do, uh, we still have a lot more to go with Mill. We really have just sort of begun our discussion of Mill here. But um, I'll leave you with a question that Mill himself considers and tries to give an answer to. So I'll give you a little assignment here. Take a look at the chapter on Mill and see if you can find how Mill answers the following objection. The objection is, you're saying that happiness is pleasure and that unhappiness is pain. We have a name for people like you. They're called hedonists, right? Remember, we talked about hedonism a while ago. Hedonism is the view that what's good is pleasure and what's bad is pain. We did this when we were talking about Plato and Aristotle. We talked about hedonism. Plato and Aristotle seem to reject hedonism. I should say they seem to. They definitely reject hedonism. We talked about that. Mill is now saying, 
that what makes an action morally right is if it promotes pleasure in society. But that's hedonistic. Are you really saying that the goal of morality or that what makes actions right is that they make for more pleasure? This sounds, and actually Mill, in explaining this objection, which he has an answer to, and that's my, my assignment to you, is to see if you can find where he addresses this objection and how he tries to uh, uh, address the objection. But Mill uh, says, I think he uses this phrase, doesn't this sound animalistic or swinish even? Okay, now this may not be fair to our, um, our swine, but the word swinish means like, I guess pigs have a reputation of wallowing around in mud to uh, cool themselves. Pigs have a, maybe it's not fair, but okay, I hope there are no pigs listening to this uh, YouTube. They might be insulted, but seriously though, um, pigs have a reputation for indulging in pleasure. Maybe that's not true, but let's just assume it's true for just the sake of argument here. The, the, the objection is, you're telling me that morality is all about promoting pleasure? Hedonistic. That, that sounds animalistic. Uh, that can't, surely that can't be right. That what makes actions moral is that they make for more pleasure in society. Okay, um, so again, that is an objection that Mill considers to his own theory of happiness. It's not really an objection against utilitarianism because you could, here's something that's important, you could believe in the principle of utility and believe that happiness is not the same thing as pleasure. Okay, then you would sort of agree with Mill on with the principle, but you would not agree with his particular theory of happiness. Okay. The reason, one of the reasons why uh, Mill wants to say that happiness is pleasure is because pleasure is something we can readily identify as to whether we're having it or not. Again, as I said before, pleasure is a sensation. It's an experience. If you're in pleasure, you know you're having pleasure. If you're having pain, you know you're in pain. It's not like some deep, weird question Am I happy? Well, if happiness is pleasure, you know whether you're having pleasure or not. So one of the things that uh, Mill considers to be an advantage of his theory is that pleasure is readily identifiable and it's also measurable. So here's another point I want to make. Again, I left you with that question. How does Mill try to answer his, his own objection and an objection that others might make that his theory of happiness uh, is, is hedonistic and animalistic, and that they can't be what morality is all about. But um, here's another advantage of Mill's theory, and I'll, maybe I'll end today with this thought. Mill would say that pleasure, this is actually an important point about pleasure, pleasure and also pain come in degrees, right? There are degrees of pleasure and there are degrees of pain. Okay, now, for example, you know, some, some experiences are moderately pleasurable, somewhat pleasurable, and then there are some experiences that are very pleasurable, intensely pleasurable. Okay, and the same thing goes for pain. I can have a mild pain. You know, when you go to the doctor and you say, I'm feeling pain, they sometimes ask you, well, on a scale of one to 10, how much pain are you having? Is it a one or is it a 10 or is it in between? You say, well, I think I'm having like a nine. Okay, that's like very painful. So pleasure and pain come in degrees. Now, um, that helps us make sense of, if, Mill is, if Mill's theory is correct, that morality has to do with promoting pleasure and uh, not promoting pain in society at large, that helps us understand why certain actions are wrong and certain actions are very wrong, okay? If I slap someone in the face for no good reason, that's wrong. But if I maim the person, if I torture someone, 
That's very wrong, right? Don't we agree with that? It's kind of a gut feeling or an intuition that we have, if you will, that causing pain is bad, but the more pain you cause, the worse your action is. Okay, if I make someone happy, on the other hand, let's suppose I say hello to the doorman or I say hello to someone passing on the street and that makes them smile. Okay, that was, that was a nice thing to do. But let's suppose I give a starving person a meal. They're very happy now, right? That's much, that's greater, that's a greater action than giving them a smile. Okay, so the idea is that pleasure has degrees, pain has degrees. The more pleasure you cause to someone, the greater your action is. The more pain you cause to someone, the worse your action is. So this is actually an idea that we haven't talked about the entire semester, which is the idea that not only do we believe that certain things are morally right or morally wrong, but we believe that certain things are gravely or really seriously morally wrong and certain actions are good, sort of okay, and then there are really, really good actions. In other words, morality comes in degrees. So there's really two ways that Mill explains that based on his theory. First of all, that pleasure and pain, like I've been explaining, comes in degrees. But also, going back to the idea of social happiness, the more quantitatively across society your action brings about happiness. If you cause happiness to one person or if you cause happiness to a large number of people, then your action is even better. And the same thing with wrong or immoral actions. So for example, to use a very horrific example, unfortunately, but you know, if you murder one person, that's bad. That's really bad. But let's suppose you're a mass murderer. You murder a lot of people. Oh my God, that's horrible. That's really, really bad. Okay, why is that? Quantity matters. That's what Mill is getting at, or at least that's one of the things he's getting at with the principle. The more happiness your action causes, the better it is. The more unhappiness your action causes, the more immoral or bad it is. Okay. Uh, we've got, uh, we made some good progress on understanding Mill's uh, theory, principle of utility, fundamental moral principle, we had consequentialism, we talked a little bit, we scratched the surface on his theory of happiness, we have to get into a discussion of how he defends the objection that his theory of happiness is hedonistic, we talked about the common denominator argument, if you have any questions or comments or if anything I'm saying is not clear, please email me, call me, ask questions. Um, I wish you all the best, stay safe and healthy, and look forward to another segment on John Stuart Mill coming up in a couple of days. Thank you, and have a good day.